Hi everyone, this is Matt from HowToGardenDesign.com. For today's video, I want to talk about three principles you need to follow in order to create a great landscape design for your yard. I'll outline what these are, and then we'll look at a good residential design example and see them in action. So, what are the principles you can follow to help create your own garden design? The first is what I call developing criteria. Criteria are a short list of dot points that you put together to describe how you want a space to look, how you want to use it, and when you want to use it. I generally only develop criteria for the main areas I want in a design, for specific activities that I want to enjoy, or main visual features I want to include in my yard. Criteria help you define a space, which is very useful when designing because it ensures that your design works. It will, hopefully, look how you want it to look, be appropriately sized and shaped, and in the right spot in your yard so you can use it to its fullest potential. I'll go into more detail on some of my beginner and blueprint guides, which are linked in the description below, so feel free to check them out after the video. The second principle we want to follow, which builds off the criteria you develop, is to use your surroundings, or your context, to help position spaces in your yard. This is a simple way to move things around and make sure you don't place a high profile space somewhere that doesn't do it any favours, like putting an entertaining space where you want to enjoy some sunshine in a dark, windy area. The third principle, once you have some criteria for an area and have a few positions you want to explore it in, is to use the specific requirements of that space, so what you need to make it work for you, to define its size and shape. In other words, making sure you make a space big enough, but not too big, so you can easily do what you want to do there. A quick example might be you want a vegetable garden. Let's have it raised as well, why not? If you just draw some lines on a page and call it a day, you may end up with a growing area that's actually a lot smaller than you anticipated, or worse, a lot bigger. If you have some criteria for how you want to use the space, so in particular how much time and effort you can put into maintaining a vegetable garden, and how much food you think you need to and can grow, you're in a better position to size the beds to something you're able to manage. So, these are the three principles I want to explore with you today. And to help us walk through them, I'm going to bring in an example of a good project I found on Pinterest. The project is called Gable House by Edmonds and Lee Architects, and the landscaping was done by the Garden Root Company. Now, I'm not certain if they did the landscape design and construction, or just construction itself, but I'll just use the term designers to broadly cover both parties. I've added their respective links to this profile, this project, in the description. They have a lot more photos of this site that I won't show here. So if you want to see more of it, please follow those links at the end of the video. Now, to try and illustrate my three principles, I'm going to focus on one area of the design in particular, this deck at the rear of the yard. And I'm going to refer to it as an informal entertaining space. So it's not really for sit down dining, it's more for drinks and light snacks. We're going to walk through the three principles I covered and see if by following them, we end up with a similar result, a similarly positioned space that the designers ended up with. Now, just a quick caveat here. The process we're following may not be what the design is actually followed. Areas in garden designs tend to appear in one of two ways. They're requested by the clients and therefore explored and included in a design from the beginning, or they fill a blank area in a design, something added midway through the process. I'm not sure which one happened here. It's possible the clients wanted two spaces to entertain people, but it's also possible the designers added it of their own accord, recognizing this position in the yard would be a good spot for that kind of activity. So the principles and processes we're going to explore may be completely wrong. Uh, even so, I like walking you through this project because it allows me to illustrate those three principles anyway. So, for our purposes, we're going to pretend this informal, entertaining space is something the clients wanted to include in the yard. Perhaps not in those words, but they requested a space they can relax with some friends and enjoy some drinks and light food. So our job is to try and find not just room for it in the design, but to find a position that allows the users to enjoy the space to its fullest. If you are your own client, which you probably are, maybe this is something you want to include in your design, in which case the following steps should prove really helpful. Right, let's take a look at the first principle we discussed, developing criteria, and how to develop some for this particular space or activity. How do we want it to look? This first point is mainly about the physical elements, so the materials, the colours, the shapes, the combinations of these things, and the contrast between them. You can find examples of these everywhere, there's images online, apps, videos, magazines and books and even in the real world. In some cases, you might not need to specify anything about how your space looks at all. You can instead draw from other areas in your design or your house and use the same material, colours and shapes, etc. So for us, 
What do we write down as a criteria point for how we want this informal entertaining space to look? We could suggest the clients want timber, maybe even a specific type, width and colour, or we could suggest we'll refer to other parts of the design to inform material choice for this space and colour, shape and the rest of it. So that can be our first criteria for this space. As I said, you don't need to specify anything about the physical look of a space if you don't want to, or don't have examples you like just yet. But if you do, it's helpful to articulate what you like as much as possible. Try to focus on broader things like colour and shape, as it's easier to find multiple options that fit those criteria than it is to find a specific colour of timber or stone. We've considered how it looks. The next thing to think about is how the clients want to use the space. We're going to reverse engineer this a little because there's a few ways this could go, but let's suggest the clients wanted a space capable of seating about six people, somewhere they could relax, have some drinks, chat, and maybe some nibbles, and somewhere to enjoy some sun and read a book. Outlining the above, the actions they'll take within the space and how many people they want to be able to seat are important, as you'll see when we shape the space. Before we get to shaping, however, we also want to think about when the clients are most likely to use this space. This doesn't mean when they're available, but what time of day, what season they're most likely to enjoy it. It doesn't mean they can't or won't use it at other points, but having a target time of when you want to enjoy the space at its best will help us position it properly. So our clients might suggest something as simple as using the area mainly in summer, and most likely entertaining in the afternoon and evening. These are straightforward and often intuitively understood by many people, but explicitly outlining them as part of our criteria for this informal entertaining space ensures we think about it as we design. And for these last two in particular, it ensures we don't place our entertaining space in an area that is less enjoyable at these particular times of day and year. So, we've now outlined our criteria, or our clients, for this space. We have a timber surface, and the colours to be determined we'll find out later, or we'll draw on other parts of the design and house to determine exactly how this kind of material can look. There's a space capable of seating about six people, somewhere they can relax, have some drinks, chat, and some nibbles and food, somewhere to enjoy some sun and read a book, and they're using the area mainly in summer and most likely entertaining in the afternoon and evening. So, with all that said, now we can start to look at the second principle, using our surroundings to position the space. There are two parts to this. One is aligning to either existing things like the house, trees or buildings, or aligning to another element in your design. The first is often known as the regulatory line, and basically means you follow an imaginary line from, say, your house out into the landscape, and you align to it. Or, as I said, you can align one part of your design to another as the design is developed and worked on. The second part about positioning is to refer to the environmental and site conditions, so where you have sun, shade, high points, low points, slopes, particular ground materials like rock, basically the natural elements of your site. Some of these are static, like the ground, Others are dynamic, like sun, shade, wind, and rain. So, we're going to pretend this example began as a simple, flat backyard. When we look at the yard itself, there are plenty of positions we could place an informal entertaining space. Here, 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 or maybe here. All of it depends on the size of the space, which we'll look at next. For now, we want to eliminate some of our possible options. And the best way to do that is to look at our criteria, see when and a little of how we want to use the space, and then remove positions that don't tick those boxes. A simple example is this area at the bottom. It's closer to the house, which is good, but from some site analysis we've done, again, something I talk more about in my links below, we know it sits on the northern side of the house, and the house is quite tall. This means placing the space here will put it in a lot of shade, even in summer. Given we want the space to experience some sunlight, these positions won't do. Our solution, as part of our initial design exploration, is to move the area towards the back of the yard. It's not rocket science, but hey, design can be pretty simple if you just think about it. As we move back, we are getting closer to the conditions we want. We are likely to get more sunlight in summer, and probably in the evening, depending on the buildings either side of us as well. One really clever, yet expensive thing the designers did was raise this platform to be higher than the normal ground level. This exposes the space to even more sunlight and adds some dynamism to the whole backyard as well. An even neater little trick I think they did was place this rear deck, or this informal entertaining area, at about the same level as the newly renovated house's kitchen floor. So when you're inside the kitchen looking out, you're at the same level and can easily see people relaxing out there. 
To me, that's a really great example of the regulating line I was talking about earlier. But in this case, it's more of a 3D approach rather than purely in kind of a top-down plan view. And I really, really like it. So we're in roughly the right area now. If we want an informal entertaining space that enjoys afternoon sunshine during summer, we need to place it towards the back of the yard. If we could raise it, even better, but that might be dependent on cost. But this whole sequence of considering when the space will be used and eliminating options is one really clear way you can use your surrounding climate and conditions to determine where things could be positioned in your design. Okay, now we're coming up to the final principle. Shaping a space by considering the specific requirements it needs to make it work for you. So our requirements in this case are mainly our criteria. In this instance, it's how we want to use it and for how many people. One way to think about criteria when it comes to shaping and sizing a space is to use those criteria to determine the minimum viable area we need to make it work. So let's look at our criteria and see if we can come up with a minimum viable size for what our clients want to use the space for. One is they want to seat around about six people. The other is the nature of what they're doing. So they're sitting back, relaxing, chatting and sharing stories. This doesn't seem that big of a deal, but if all we thought about was the number of people, I could you know, put in a bench and say I've met the brief. It meets six people, they can talk, we're all done. But that's not the nature of how they want to use the space. Think about when you sit in a chair. The area you take up is more than the chair seat itself. If you have your legs out in front of you and room at the side uh, for your arms and other people. Take it further and think about the fact how often you move a chair in and out to get into it or allow people to pass behind. We are less likely to do that in an informal entertaining space, but just like a normal lounge room, you need to allow space around any seats for people to get by. So some room behind the chairs and in front by people's legs could be useful. Add in something like a coffee table to support drinks, food, books, and maybe feet, and you're suddenly covering a reasonable amount of area. If you're unsure how to determine how much we'd need, look at existing furniture and spaces around you, like the chairs in a lounge room or the area of a lounge room itself. This gives you a ready-made template to work from to measure out how much space we need to seat six people and allow them to relax in relative comfort. And that really is the best way to determine the minimum space we need for our informal entertaining area. You can orient things in different ways and move them around. In fact, I'd encourage you to explore as many different ideas as possible. Move these components within a space, so the chairs, the tables, and anything else you think it needs to make it work, and move them around in different configurations. See what works best not just for the space itself, but how it interacts with the spaces around it. And if you explore having different spaces around it, so not just the garden beds we see here, you'll find you need to orient the components within the space differently to make things work. So in the example we have here, all the components are mobile, so the orientation and position of these chairs and tables matters a lot less. They're flexible and can be moved around, but the important thing is they have the space to do so. This is one thing I want to draw your attention to around what the designers did on this occasion. I mentioned above that you need to ensure you have room around your chairs and things so people can move through the space while others are sitting down. You don't want them clambering over each other to get out. But I also said you need to consider how this space interacts with others around it. And this design provides a great example of that. You can see we have three garden beds along the left, back and right sides. Now I usually think of garden beds as features, so they're visual elements that are intended to be, well, you know, features rather than a space you physically occupy to use. Although you need access to maintain them, you're not really going into them like you would with our informal entertaining space here. This is important because, as you can see, this means we can push components back. In this case, the chairs and tables, we can actually push them closer to the garden beds themselves. No one needs to go around the back of the chairs, really, to get to other parts behind the space. So the designers reduced the sides of the deck slightly, which probably allowed the garden beds to get bigger. Again, I'm speculating here a little, but I hope you get the point I'm making. When we look at sizing a space, we consider what we need to make it work. The good designers think about the other areas around it and how this space will interact with those, and they'll notice when they can take advantage of things like space, which in this case is in very short supply given how small the yard is. The flip side occurs on the other side, where there is plenty of room. Perhaps for easy access, or to add more chairs, or simply to fill up the space of these steps, they've actually widened that deck a little bit more. It's likely to be a mixture of the three, and it could have evolved over a few different iterations of the design. I actually really like it because it actually gives people from the far side of the steps the ability to just easily walk to the steps without having to clamber over people to get out. So I think, looking at this informal entertaining space, 
the design is probably the minimum space I'd feel comfortable with for the criteria we originally set. For our version of the design, we could expand it a little if we like, perhaps widening it a little bit, or maybe narrow a raised garden bed at the back. But ultimately, for this design in this small yard, that extra space for this deck is unlikely to add much value to the space itself. If you had a larger space, your actual yard would have more room to spread out, then you could explore how big you really wanted to go. Maybe you could make it larger until you align with another regulatory line in your design, such as the side of your house or another area of your design. Or maybe you think about how cheap or expensive the space is likely to be. If it's cheap, feel free to cover a larger area, and that way you get more bang for your buck. If it's expensive, keep it to a minimum size and let other cheaper areas, like a garden bed, fill in the space. I've talked a little bit elsewhere about the idea of engineering versus art in design. I'll link that in the description if you're interested. But when I think about introducing more art into a design, I tend to think about this balance between ensuring the space does what you need, so the minimum size you need to make it work, and the maximum you're willing to expand to. All that possible space in between is something of a spectrum, and you can explore different ways to fill it. That's where your own artistic approach and preferences can take over. So I think I've rambled on enough here. I hope you found this little exploration useful. So let's quickly touch on three principles we went through and how you can apply them to your own designs. Number one, develop your own criteria. So what you want the space to look like, how you want to use it, and when. You don't need to know all of these right at the start. You can chop and change your criteria as you go when you're finding more examples or you're taking points from other parts of your design or even adjusting how you want to use the space and when you want to use it. Two, use your surroundings to position a space in your design. Generally, more about when you want to use the space and it's most helpful for the major areas of your design. And reality is you will have clashes where certain spots are good for multiple activities or spaces. And if that's the case, you'll need to try and combine the areas to cover multiple things or prioritize which one goes where. And really think about the best conditions for this particular space. It's not always about sunshine and shade. You might need to consider things like wind, rain, neighbors looking into your space, all kind of things covered in the site analysis section in the links I've provided below. Finally, we looked at using the requirements of the activity or space to shape and size it. Again, this is generally about how you actually use a space, so the physical movements within it, what you need to make it work, things like seats and tables, etc. And you can use existing things around you to get an idea of how large, small, wide, narrow, tall or short something often is, and start with those dimensions first before you break away from them. Once you have an idea of these dimensions or requirements, every time you design the space you have a benchmark for whether, for whether or not it will work for you, what I call the minimum viable area for a space. As you get more comfortable, think about the areas around this space and how they interact with it. Do you need to maintain access all the time to an area nearby? Can you save some space and use it better elsewhere? Lastly, you don't need to stick to the minimum size. That just lets you know you've designed something that should work for you that it meets all your criteria. You can expand the space to be larger until you meet other parts of the design. And again, this is where that art can come in, where you don't need to justify why something is a particular shape or layout. As long as the space functions how it should, you can go a little crazy with the outer edges if you like. So after all that, that's it for today's video. Thanks for exploring a particularly good design with me. Once again, it's called Gable House by Edmonds and Lee Architects and was constructed and perhaps designed as well by the Garden Root Company and I've linked both in the description below. If you enjoyed this walkthrough of the three principles please let me know below and don't forget to subscribe and check out the links to my website below. This is Matt from howtogardendesign.com and thanks once again.